Good morning, everyone. And you're very welcome to our webinar this morning um, on working from home, quantifying economic and environmental impacts and opportunities. Um, I'll just share some slides that we have prepared and introduce the, the panel to you. So my name is Alma McCarthy and I work at Inui Galway uh, in J. Kern School of Business and Economics and also affiliated with Whitaker Institute. Um, I'm joined this morning for in the next hour by um, uh, two of my, three of my colleagues here from Inui Galway, Dr. Tom McDermott, who is an environmental economist in J. Kern School of Business and Economics, uh, Dr. Owen Clifford, who's a civil engineer in our engineering school, in the College of Engineering and Science, Joseph Mee, who's studying uh, engineering here at, in the university with us. And we're delighted to be uh, joined by Professor John Fitzgerald, who's going to act as our um, discussant this morning. And John is um, a member of the Climate Change Advisory Council and adjunct professor in Trinity College, Dublin. So that's the, the panel that's here. It's very much a, an interdisciplinary team and um, we're delighted to welcome so many to this webinar this morning. So very briefly, I might just introduce um, the backdrop to the data we're presenting. We're focused very much this morning on looking at uh, economic and environmental impacts and opportunities that arise um, from research that we conducted over the last year and a half uh, in the Whitaker Institute and in association with the Western Development Commission. So in the screen in front of you there, there's a, a screenshot of uh, a number of different reports that are available um, and different data sets that we have gathered. Uh, so we started to collect data on uh, remote working um, back in April 2020 was the first data set we gathered just six weeks after um, the, the mandatory lockdown. Um, and we took um, a pulse, if you like, at three different points in time over the last uh, year and a half or so. And um, those reports and research, the outcomes of those findings are available on the Whitaker um, website. What we're focused on, and a lot of the focus of those reports was around the HR issues and employment issues and employer practices and what they were doing and em employee experiences of what that mandated um, forced exper experiment that we had with uh, remote working. Uh, what we're looking at today is um, focusing specifically on the um, October 2020 data, so the second report on screen there, where we had worked with, um, I worked with, with Owen and uh, Tom looking at travel data and some uh, additional modules in our survey, um, looking at what were the um, sort of habits, if you like, around travel and environmental questions that we um, included in that survey. And that's what we're focusing on very much today. So if you're interested in other questions, um, you can look up those research reports on the Whitaker website. Just in terms of some very brief introductory um, points to note from our survey, we had huge response to the surveys that we've conducted to date. Um, in, in April 2020, there was over 7,000 responses. And in October 2026, 20, months on, uh, there was over 5,600 responses. Um, and very clearly, um, you know, obviously in the in the April data, 87% um, were working remotely um, because we were the government was very clear in its in its public health guidelines as to, to the requirement to do so where we could. In the October 2020 data, 68% um, were working remotely and 24% were a mix of on-site and remote because a number of people had come back um, to work at that point, uh, given the guidelines that were there. Um, there was one of the most outstanding findings from our data is that there was a huge appetite and there is a huge appetite to continue to work remotely or hybrid for some or all of the time post crisis. So you can see here on, on the left of your screen, it's the initial April 2020 data, just six weeks after lockdown. And on the right hand side, it's, it's October 2020, six, six or so months on. What was, I, I suppose, surprising, and we see it even now as we are, you know, looking ahead, that appetite to uh, be able to work remotely for some or all of the time is very, very high. Um, and in October 2020, 27% would like to work remotely on a daily basis. That was full, full time. 54% would like to work remotely several times a week. 
um, and 13% would like to work remotely several times a month. And only 6% didn't want to work remotely at all. So as we, as we spring forward to where we're at now, we can see that organizations are very much responding to that. And it looks like the, the um, HR agenda is working towards a hybrid model. Just to pull out a couple of the kind of key findings as well around the advantages and disadvantages and challenges at that time. Um, they're what you would expect, I suppose, from the 5,600 responses we had. The top three advantages of remote working, no traffic and, and no commute, greater flexibility as to how to manage the working day and reduce costs of going to work and commuting. Um, and of course, there are all, also significant uh, challenges and problems to be worked around. The loneliness, isolation, um, impact was very high for a lot of people. Um, staying motivated was cited as the second biggest challenge and challenges around uh, the physical workspace at home, ergonomics, the, the setup with your desk and office space was the third most cited challenge in the data set at that time when we looked at the employee experience. Um, in terms of HR opportunities, challenges, and future directions, I just want to bring attention to a couple of, of things that we're seeing in the data and um, from working with employers and looking at, at HR policy in particular, before we start to move on to the economic and environmental impacts, which we're focused on mostly today. Um, it does look very much like um, the future is hybrid or blended or flex or distributed or uh, anywhere workforce. They are kind of the terminologies that are there. And a lot of organizations are seeing um, offering hybrid um, as required really in terms of talent attraction and retention. Um, it's very clear that one size doesn't fit all employees. So even within organizations, there's a lot of flexibility within the, that flex model, depending on teams or particular employees, scenarios and situations. And this presents um, you know, a lot of challenges for, for HR um, departments and managers to manage that. Um, a lot of companies in their, as they're planning are really starting to focus on what activities are best done remotely um, and not solely on roles. So that's been a big change as well, is that there's, it's splitting up the work to look at, well, what works best in a remote context and then what works best in a collaborative um, on-site context. Um, significant management and leadership mindset changes needed here in terms of, of trusting people when they're not on site. Um, the, there's a lot of work to be done with um, tr training organizations and managers and teams on how to work in this hybrid model, which presents a very different landscape for how we work into the future. Um, the impact on employee well-being um, in general and in the workplace in particular, and the engagement exhaustion balance has been cited as a real challenge that organizations are facing um, in supporting employees. And that, of course, is one of the big HR agendas that has to be worked on. Issues have come up in terms of impact on equality. For example, uh, for females, um, a, a, a lot of the data would say females are more impacted by what has happened over the last 18 months. Um, but as we go forward, um, you know, that people who are working in hybrid or more remote contexts, that they will have the same career opportunities, the same networking opportunities as those who are on site. So these are some of the challenges that are coming up. Um, and a lot of uh, employers would talk about the need to manage connectivity and collaboration and the impact on innovation and making sure that when people come together, that that, that, that coming together is still retained. So hybrid offers a lot of flexibility um, and, and a lot of opportunities in terms of, of HR and, and what organizations can offer to their employees. But of course, there are a number of challenges to be managed. So that's just bringing you through very briefly some of the sort of top line findings um, from the studies looking at the employment context per se. Um, a lot more information available on the Whitaker uh, website and we can share that um, after um, with attendees today. But today we want to kind of focus in on looking at the, the economic and environmental um, opportunities. And um, I'm delighted to, to hand over to um, my colleague, uh, Tom, who's going to take us through some of the data, honing in specifically on the question around um, economic um, opportunities and, and challenges that exist when we start to look at some of the data that we've looked at in the study in that context. So I'll hand over to you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Salma. I, I thought Owen wanted to go next. To, um, I think so, I, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I think I'm next. So I, I, I go ahead, Owen. <laughs> so over to Owen, who's going to look at the travel data and um, looking at the emissions and environmental uh, opportunities. Thank you. 
No problem. Thanks uh, very much, Emma. And um, hopefully everyone uh, can see my screen there. So I'm just going to take you on um, maybe a journey of some of the key uh, findings from the survey in terms of the types of emissions, uh, the emission reduction potential that could occur from working from home. We focused on um, emission carbon dioxide emissions, um, but of course there will be other benefits such as reductions in air pollution, et cetera, which we have the data to look at, but I am not uh, presenting that data today. So just a background from, I suppose, uh, an emissions point of view, that transport in 2020 accounted for about 18% of Ireland's emissions. Um, this was almost 16% down from 2019, but mainly due to COVID. And the expectation is that it will return to pre-COVID levels in 2022. In fact, with current measures, without any of the additional measures we've uh, proposed by the government, uh, the EPA has projected very limited reductions in transport emissions by 2030. Now, of course, uh, new measures proposed by the government may impact that significantly. And currently in Ireland, um, just over 61% of uh, workers used private vehicles to commute to work. So that's kind of just a bit of the uh, the background. And in general, the, the, I suppose the overall question in relation to this survey was, uh, can some of the trends from COVID-19 help permanently change uh, 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 emissions trends post-2021? And with that in mind, we, based on the data from the survey, we set about looking at the potential emissions reductions that could occur from working uh, from home. We analyzed the trends in commuting patterns, mission and emissions pre, uh, during and post COVID-19, and also looked at the data from a re at a regional level and also at an economic sector level. So I'll take you through some of the high level uh, results from these key questions. Just a, a bit of background in the survey itself, in the second national remote working survey, we included 10 questions related to transportation. And these questions allowed us to classify vehicles by a year and also by their Europe classification, which is what we use to actually generate the um, emissions data. Just to be clear, we're looking at the tailpipe emissions only. So um, we are not looking at, for example, the uh, manufacturing emissions of vehicles or issues such as wear and tear. So it is simply the tailpipe emissions only. So therefore, cycling and walking are deemed to have zero emissions under this uh, particular heading. And the results were characterized as per IPCC 2013 uh, standards using, we use the eco Invent life cycle uh, database. So overall, in terms of the, the summary findings, um, we were at, we are able to analyze uh, 3,811 responses. Um, and we, of course, we do have some limitations based on the type of data, the responses that we did get, one of which being that 77% of the responses were female and 23% were male. The average commuting distance in our uh, uh, responses was 24 kilometers with an average commuting time of 42 minutes one way. Uh, as an example, in 2016, the average commuting time in Ireland, uh, according to the CSO, was 28 minutes, albeit it was expected to increase uh, from that year onwards. So I would expect we're not too far out of line with uh, overall CSO data there. Our modal share, you can see there on the left, was about 68% car van, 7% walk, 5% cycle, and 20% public transport. And that compares with about 61% or 62% caravan in the CSO um, data. In terms of a regional uh, balance on the right hand side, you can see about 31% of our responses were from Dublin and then about 24% from the West. And the rest of the responses then were spread uh, somewhat relatively evenly between the other uh, regions. So again, some regions will be overestimated in our, or overrepresented in our data, and some will be underrepresented. And in terms of uh, economic sectors, we had responses under um, every economic sector as measured uh, by the CSO. Um, we one percent would have that way, would have ranged between one percent of our responses being from the accommodation and food services sector to nineteen percent being from uh, education. So in terms of representation, the accommodation and food services would have been most underrepresented in our um, survey responses and public administration, defense and compulsory social security would have been most overrepresented in the survey itself. 
But with all that being in mind, it is a, a survey of nearly almost 4,000 respondents, so it is likely to be relatively robust. Uh, in terms of the types, just breaking it down a little bit further, the overall results in terms of what people, how people are commuting. Uh, so this slide here just gives an overall, I suppose, summary for each uh, major mode of transport. So, for example, those who were cycling commuted an average of just under six kilometers in about 24 minutes. For a car, it was just under 28 kilometers in uh, 40 minutes. Public transport, about 25 kilometers in 62 minutes. And walking was about two 0.8 kilometers in 26 minutes. So people were both reporting their time for commuting, but also uh, the distance that they commuted as well. Okay, so moving on to some of the results, um, I suppose the key high level result was that there is approximately 60% uh, potential emission saving if everyone adopted their preferred remote, remote working um, options. So as uh, respondents indicated to us what their preferred level of remote working was, if they were allowed to adopt that full time, it would result in approximately 60% reduction in commuting emissions from pre to post COVID. If everyone was to continue as it was during full lockdown, that would be almost a 90% reduction in commuting related emissions um, from uh, pre to post COVID. Obviously that's highly unlikely um, to happen. Just to give you an indication of what that means on an individual uh, basis, if you look on the left hand side, the average uh, commuting emissions per person would drop from about 1,280 down to just over 500 kilograms per person uh, per year. And in terms of the overall uh, emissions due to commuting across the country, they would drop from about 3,100 kilotons carbon dioxide per year to about 1,200 kilotons of carbon dioxide, and I'll put that in a national uh, context later on. So going into some of the regional data from this, so of course we have looked at every region, but I, I don't have time to present that in detail. So what I've done here is uh, presented the Midlands region and the Dublin region. The Midlands region being because uh, in general across the Midlands, people had the highest emissions per person for commuting. So pre-COVID, that was about uh, 3,000 kilos of carbon dioxide per person per year. And post-COVID, if they, their preferences were enabled for working from home, that would, do, would reduce to about 1,060. There will be some caveats to these that we will discuss later on. It won't surprise anyone to note that in Dublin, uh, commuting emissions per person were lowest at about 500, and that would reduce to about 200 if they were allowed for work from home as per their preferences. And you can see in red also um, the average across the country in relation to that. So it's interesting to see that the commuting emissions for respondents from the Midlands were almost um, six times that as they were from respondents from Dublin. And that obviously indicates the level of public transport and shorter commutes that there will be in Dublin. Across the board, the savings ranged from the potential savings from working from home um, as per respondents' preferences, range from about 53% savings in the border regions to about 65% in the Midlands, with all the other regions falling between about 58% and 63%. So what you can see here is that there's a pretty consistent across all regions uh, potential for um, emissions reductions. And I just want to show you here in this slide some of the details in terms of car uh, usage, because of course recently the issue of electrical uh, vehicles is very much on the agenda. And what the graph here shows you the typical emissions uh, per person per car or fuel type that they have. So, for example, those who have used uh, diesel cars as their uh, mode of transport for commuting pre COVID are emitting almost uh, 2,000 uh, kilos of carbon dioxide per person per year. And post-COVID, uh, that would drop to approximately 840 if they were uh, enabled to work from home. For those with uh, battery electric, so electric vehicles, their pre-COVID emissions would have been about 545 per person, and post-COVID would be about 220 uh, per person as well. And you can see for other vehicles uh, that changes. I should mention at this stage um, that many of the lifecycle inventory databases model um, hybrid, both plug-in and hybrid electric as small petrol vehicles, and there are a number of reasons for that. 
um, both the lack of data, but also how those vehicles are used. Diesel cars were associated with the longest commutes as well, which would be one of the reasons why the emissions per person would be higher. And you can see that in some of the data here. And it's interesting to note that the commute in the Midlands, our average commute was about 54 kilometers compared to Dublin, where it was about 12 kilometers. Okay, there's a lot going on on this slide. Um, and what we've done down here on this slide is broken down the potential emission savings from pre-COVID to post-COVID by uh, industrial uh, sector, economic sector, which you can see on the right hand side. Again, there's a relatively consistent uh, potential across all industrial sectors, albeit that may be somewhat reflect some of the uh, types of responses that we got. And this would range from generally from 50% in the accommodation and food services to about 68% in the transportation and storage um, uh, sector albeit that in both of those sectors, we had fairly limited responses. In one of the sectors, for example, where we had quite a number of responses would have been in administrative and support services, and the potential emissions reductions there were about 66%. But you can see across all industrial sectors, there is at least, according to our responses, about a 50% potential emissions reduction to be had from working from home. So looking at a number of uh, scenarios uh, that I suppose that might uh, um, hopefully uh, emerge over the next number of years, one of them we looked at was, was what would happen if we met our target of approximately uh, 1 million EVs by 2030. And on top of that, we achieved our remote working uh, targets as well, or potential as per this. What we would likely see then is about a 73% reduction in total emissions from the combination of remote working plus the introduction of EVs. Now, it should be said that a million EVs by 2030 would still mean that we have um, almost one and a half million uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, cars by that stage as well. So you still have a majority of fossil fuel cars, but a very significant number of EVs. And this may even be an underestimation to a certain extent because EVs themselves would become more efficient as the electricity grid uh, as more renewables are brought onto the national grid, and also uh, public transport improvements as well will probably will probably significantly influence these, not to mind walking or cycling. But based on the data we collected, you are looking at uh, an additional benefit and a significant additional benefit from uh, the introduction of EVs. The other uh, issue we looked at, and this had to do with a question in the survey, um, which Tom will be will go into in a bit more detail, but it looked at whether people would relocate or have relocated as to um, because remote working has been enabled. And what uh, I did here was we just modeled uh, relocations for, for, from example, Dublin to the west of Ireland or Dublin uh, to the Midlands and how this would impact uh, the potential for um, uh, emissions reduction. So what you can see here is the maximum potential for emissions reductions that we've seen in our responses, about 61% from working from home. As people relocate from Dublin to the west or to the Midlands, that potential reduction decreases. The reason being because even though they may be adopting work from home, they are now possibly having uh, longer commutes. And Based on our data, for every approximately 1% population shift um, from Dublin, you will get about a 0.2% emissions gain if those people, for example, move to the Midlands. That uh, trend will be less significant if they move somewhere to the west, and that is uh, due to the average uh, reduced um, commuting distances that uh, people have in the west compared to the Midlands. Now, there are, of course, caveats to what I'm showing here, and we, we have a lot more uh, detail on some of this and can look at this in a lot more detail. But one thing we do assume here is that once people move, for example, from Dublin to the West, that their average commute main is um, the average of someone living in the West. However, that may not be the case if they continue to work in Dublin. So they may then travel twice a week, for example, to work in Dublin and thus their average commute is much longer than someone in uh, the region that they have just moved to. But you can see here that there is a potential, uh, that relocation has a potential to ne negatively impact uh, this uh, reduction. 
So to try and put these in an overall national context, so the emissions from various sectors are shown in this graphic here, and I've just looked at it as a percentage. The total national emissions are in and around 60 million tonnes per annum. And um, if you look at the transport proportion, it's 20%, of which, according to our data, about 5% of that, or sorry, about uh, a quarter of that would be um, commuting, so that's 5% of our total emissions, and 15% will be of our total emissions will be due to other transport, so about uh, three quarters of the um, overall um, uh, transport emissions. So you can see that the part that we are impacting here is approximately 5% of our national emissions. Now, we don't have statistics in Ireland looking at the commuting emissions, but there is data from the UK to indicate that commuting will be about 25% of the overall um, transport emissions in the UK, and that's in and around where our data um, is coming down at. So just in summary, just two slides to quickly summarise. So um, if everyone was allowed to operate the preferred working from home data, the potential will be about a 60% reduction in commuting emissions. This translates to about uh, 1,800 kilotons of CO2 saving per annum on a national basis and approximately 16 to 20% reduction in transport emissions. That will be approximately equivalent to the heat and electricity use from about 360,000 homes annually, just to put it in that context. Um, there would definitely be, as we can see, further benefits from uh, transport changes and particularly from the uptake of um, electric vehicles. And in order to, uh, I suppose, some of the key challenges will be how can we maximise potential across all regions and sectors. And we also, in, within this, we have to look at both local and regional planning, but also issues around that relocation uh, uh, might challenge us on. Other knock-on benefits that we haven't looked at, uh, which will be extremely significant, will be things like reduced air uh, pollution and reduced con congestion, just to name a few. And from my side, I would uh, put it out there that it, it is possibly one of the easiest savings to make from the point of view that to a certain extent, we have already shown we can do it. Employers have shown that they can accommodate it and people have shown that they actually want to do it uh, as a result of the COVID period. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Tom uh, for the next set of slides uh, where we'll, he'll probably talk a bit more about some of the pitfalls and some of the rebound effects. And just before I finish off, I'd like to, just to thank and acknowledge uh, Joseph Mee as a BE student here in NUI Galway and Ronan Cooney, a postdoctoral researcher here in NUI Galway, who being honest did most of the, uh, uh, the two of those did most of the analysis on this data and also to Alma for allowing us to include the questions in her survey. So thanks very much, and I'll hand over to you now, Tom. Thanks, Owen. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, share my slides. While you're sharing there, um, Tom, I might just yep. remind our participants that you're very welcome to put up um, questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there. So we welcome questions mm -hmm. to the panel, and um, Joseph will help um, myself uh, to moderate that. So uh, questions very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, so uh, picking up on some of the themes that uh, Owen and Alma have outlined so far, I'm going to be presenting some social and economic analysis of the, the data we have on the shift to uh, an increase in remote working. And particularly the economic analysis is, is mainly based here on uh, looking at people's stated preferences, so what they say they would like to do in terms of commuting versus uh, remote working. And I suppose just to give kind of uh, a flavor of the headlines, what we find is the, um, that there's been, uh, on the whole, a very positive experience of working from home or remote working during the pandemic, maybe surprisingly so. I think people have been uh, somewhat surprised by how, how um, easy they've, relatively easy, they found it to work from home and, and found it to make this, this shift. Um, we also find, in addition to the potential for emission savings that uh, Owen has outlined, we also find that there's a big potential here for, not surprisingly, large time savings, so from reduced commuting, and productivity gains from the, the increase in remote working. But I suppose, as, as Owen has already suggested, I'll, I'll uh, do the typical economist role of pointing out some potential caveats, some potential concerns that we need to take account of and looking at uh, what kind of evidence we have on these. So for example, while the initial experience, the short-term experience of remote working seems to have been very positive, certainly from the employee's point of view, should we be concerned about potential longer term effects on productivity? And Alma kind of alluded to some of that already. 
uh, and also effects on career prospects for those who choose to uh, work remotely more frequently. Um, and that also then raises the issue of uh, the equality of remote working. So clearly access to and benefits from re remote working uh, flow predominantly to some groups more than others within society. And that might be uh, something we need to be concerned about. And finally, then I'll mention some uh, potential rebound effects. So Owen mentioned about the relocation. Uh, I think that is something we need to, we need to consider whether uh, people might trade off the ability to work from home more frequently against uh, the distance that they're willing to, to commute when they do uh, attend their workplace. So I'll show you some evidence on that as well. Um, okay, so the, the big shift in preferences for remote working that we've seen and that Alma has illustrated in her data seems to have been underpinned by a surprisingly positive experience of working from home during the pandemic. Uh, so here I'm just comparing uh, what respondents say uh, they would like to do post pandemic in terms of the, the frequency with which they want to continue uh, working from home across people who worked from home exclusively, so full time during the pandemic versus those who were working from home, who were, uh, had a mix of working from home and working on site. And what you see is that the pattern is largely similar. If anything, those who were working from home exclusively during the pandemic express a stronger preference to continue doing so. So about a third of those want to work from home daily uh, beyond the pandemic if they were allowed. And that suggests at the very least that people weren't uh, put off by this experience, that they weren't, they aren't, uh, they aren't sick of uh, uh, remote working at this point which in itself suggests uh, that the experience has been relatively good. Some other data from the, from the survey also illustrates this. So more than half of respondents say they're more optimistic about working from home since the pandemic began. And nearly four out of five respondents agree that it's easy to work from home. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we're seeing, I think perhaps surprisingly a very positive experience at least from the employee's point of view of the initial phase of, of uh, remote working. And of course, as I mentioned, alongside environmental benefits, there's also potential productivity gains from uh, the reduction in time spent commuting. And what we find in the data is that uh, our median respondent, so kind of the average person in our data, would, in an ideal world, reduce their total commuting time per week by fully three hours. Uh, and that's equivalent to a, a productivity gain for that worker of about 8%, or uh, 90 euro saving in terms of the, the time, the value of the time that they're now not having to give up uh, if they're unable to do so, not having to give up uh, for commuting. And of course, there will be additional uh, financial benefits for the individual of not having to, to uh, spend as much money on transport costs. And that chimes very much with, again, as, as Alma mentioned earlier, the, the, the top three advantages of remote working. So people recognize these benefits. They, they say that their, their top benefits are no traffic, no commute, increased flexibility, and reduced costs uh, of going to work. So um, maybe not surprisingly, uh, people value the flexibility of remote working, but the, the scale of the potential uh, savings, I think are quite, quite large here in terms of the benefits to, to workers and the benefits overall for the economy of uh, this, this increased productivity, this reduction in this um, uh, time spent commuting, which is relatively unproductive time. So the question then is, okay, people value uh, working from home and it, it's clearly um, um, largely beneficial for the employees, but are people actually more or less productive when, while working from home? Um, and in the literature, there's at least some evidence to suggest that people who work from home are actually more productive uh, than those who attend their workplace. And that's a combination of spending more time actually working, so maybe fewer breaks, uh, and also being more productive while working. And there's, there's some initial evidence, at least in our data, that at least from the employee's point of view, from their perspective, uh, people are being quite productive while working from home. So more than half of our respondents say that they worked more hours on average when working remotely compared to on site. Um, and more than a third of respondents cited, I get more work done as one of the advantages of working from home. So at least initially, and at least from the employee's point of view, there does seem to be uh, some productivity benefits also from working from home, that people are very productive while they work from home. The question is, if that's a short run effect and, and what we see in the literature is a kind of a short run effect also of, of people working from home being more productive, what might happen over the longer term? Uh, how might productivity in certain tasks be affected? So there's at least anecdotal evidence of 
um, you know, more creative, innovative, maybe team-based tasks being less suited to this remote working? And, and might that be an issue going forward that we see less of that activity or that that activity becomes uh, less effective, less productive uh, if we have this very big shift to uh, remote working in the long term? So alongside the shift in preferences for not commuting as often, that also seems to reflect a, a very large reduction in the perceived value of attending the office or attending the workplace. So people are uh, less willing to give up their time commuting to their workplace. Uh, so a big reduction in, in the perceived value of being on site. But interestingly, that value is not zero. So if you flip this around and say, well, in an ideal world, if you ask people, what's your preferred number of days commuting per week, and they say, well, it's not zero, then the question arises, why are people prepared to spend time and money uh, traveling from their home to their workplace? Okay, so if you like, only 27% said they would work remotely daily, or in other words, only that figure say they would prefer not to incur the costs of commuting at all. So the remainder of people are prepared to put up with those costs, at least some of the time. And the question might be, well, why would they incur those costs if they don't necessarily have to. And so clearly some of this uh, is about social aspects. So one of the one of the responses, and Alma mentioned this already, that people gave to the survey is that uh, loneliness and isolation is a problem with remote working. So people miss the human interaction of being in the workplaces. But the fact that there's a value to attending the workplace might also be about career prospects. And again, there's evidence of this in the literature uh, um, uh, where, whereby people who are working remotely uh, appear to have significantly lower promotion rates than their colleagues who are in the office full time. Um, and so that might raise a question mark then about, well, if people are choosing to work remotely, are those people in the longer term going to be disadvantaged in their careers? And that again raises this issue about generally the, the um, distributional effects or the equality, uh, inequality that's built into remote working. So we know that uh, access to and benefits of remote working flow disproportionately to workers who are relatively well educated and work in relatively well paid jobs um, by the nature of their work, but also uh, uh, for various other reasons. And there's also this concern around uh, gender effects that I think uh, Alma mentioned earlier on. So if, uh, as seems to be the case in some other countries where, where surveys show that a greater proportion of women seem to want to continue working from home, and if that has longer term implications for career prospects, we might be concerned about uh, this having uh, a, a gender, uh, increasing gender inequality as a result of increased remote working. So looking at our data, actually what we find is that there's very little difference in preferences for remote working across male and female respondents. If anything, uh, male respondents express a slightly stronger preference for working from home uh, on a daily basis. And even when we break this down, looking at those who have and haven't uh, childcare responsibilities, again, it's very even. And if anything, it's uh, men with childcare responsibilities in our survey who expressed the strongest uh, preference for working from home daily. Um, one area where we do see a bit of a discrepancy is those with and without elder care responsibilities. So women with elder care responsibilities do seem to have a stronger preference for uh, working from home daily than men with elder care responsibilities. So that might be one issue where there is uh, a bit of a gender divide. But on average, it seems like there isn't, in contrast to some surveys in other countries, there isn't a big difference in uh, working from home preferences across male and female respondents in our data. Uh, so lastly, then, I wanted to um, pick up on this point, uh, which Owen was making about um, if you like rebound effects or changes in people's behavior as working remotely becomes uh, uh, kind of normalized over the longer term. So all of our calculations that we present in terms of emission savings and in terms of time savings, assume that people's commutes don't change. And that might be a reasonable assumption to make at least in the short run. Longer term, we might wonder, well, will people, as Owen suggested, relocate or will they change other behaviors which might offset somehow uh, the potential savings that we've, we've described. So one thing that's very clear in the data is that across our respondents, there appears to be a trade-off between commuting distance and the frequency with which people commute. So pre-pandemic, those who attend the office less frequently 
tended to have much longer commutes on average. And you can see this very clearly in the data here. So this is uh, average total kilometers traveled per week uh, for work. So commuting distance traveled per week across respondents who attended the, offer, the, the office um, different numbers of days per week. So you can see for those attending the office twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, and five times a week, so the blue bars are pre-pandemic, the, the, the total distance being traveled is remarkably similar. So whether you're at the, at the office twice a week or five times a week, it seems that the total distance being traveled is almost the same. And clearly what's happening there is people who are attending the office less frequently are putting up with much longer commutes on the days when they do, when they do go to work. And so clearly if that, uh, if that kind of pattern was reflected in people's behavior once remote working becomes uh, much more embedded, um, then we would, we would likely see some of the potential gains being offset by people uh, adopting longer commutes. So will people uh, relocate? Well, we did ask in the survey about people's intentions and almost half say they would consider it with 7% already having relocated. And maybe not surprisingly, uh, the biggest proportion of people looking to relocate are currently in Dublin. And as Owen points out, Dublin is where commutes are relatively short and where the mode is least likely to be a uh, private car or van. So um, if people are relocating out of Dublin, presumably largely motivated by looking for uh, lower housing costs, one would think, does that mean they end up then with longer commutes and more likely to be commuting uh, using private cars? So that raises issues clearly for planning policies, for transport policies, et cetera. So policies that might be um, uh, complementary to a, a shift towards remote working. Okay, other rebound effects, I won't spend long on this, but just to mention, it's also possible that as people commute less, they don't necessarily use their cars less, so they may be um, still having to uh, uh, engage in lots of driving for other purposes, dropping kids to school, doing the shopping, etc. Uh, so when you look at the actual data on traffic volumes, um, comparing 2020 and, and 2019, you see that in April 2020, when the, we had the most severe restrictions, there was a really, really large reduction in traffic volume. So this is just car traffic nationally, uh, down about 80% in April 2020 versus 2019. Once the schools were back in September 2020, the reduction is, is much less. Now it's still significant, a 20% reduction in car traffic is, is not nothing, but you can see also the red line there is 2021 traffic levels, and you can see they're, they're creeping back up towards where they were in 2019. Uh, so it may be that we also need to look at transport policy for other journey types and not just commuting if we're, if we're to maximize the benefits, uh, potential benefits of remote working. One last uh, point on, on kind of rebound effects is we're probably all aware that our um, energy bills have been rising uh, during the pandemic as we've been working from home. So will increased emissions from home working again offset some of the the potential gains from less commuting. So it may be that it's less efficient to have people dispersed and working at home than, uh, than working in their offices. And also there may be implications there for employers, certainly big firms who need to be uh, reporting their emissions. Do they then have to start taking account of uh, people's working from home or remote working emissions as part of their, their overall company reporting? Okay, I've probably taken up a little more time than I had intended. So the conclusions are, are, are essentially a recap on, on what I've shown you. Uh, clearly, we need more research and more data to further investigate some of the issues that, that we've raised here. Um, and it, from a policy point of view, the issues, the potential gains are large and people clearly benefit from the flexibility of remote working. But the issues suggest that there may be a range of, of policy interventions or complementary policies required to ensure that we uh, maximize those gains and that we avoid or at least minimize any unintended uh, negative effects. Uh, so I'll leave it there and I think I'm handing to uh, John. Thanks. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I must say it's a fascinating study with a large sample um, and um, you've really squeezed the data to produce a lot of really interesting results. Um, <clears throat> one thing which I think would be useful is to reweight your data by the census, um, that there's an overrepresentation of the Midlands and so on. So that I think that the, it, it, and that would, could significantly affect the results. So I would reweight by 
the uh, uh, data that are available, consensus, labor force survey, and so on. Um, the, <coughs> um, uh, 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 the issue of relocation is significant. And the results, Tom, which you showed, where quite a lot of people were interested in relocating. The problem is if they relocate from Dublin to the Midlands and they commute two days a week, it has a very negative environment. Like it's not just the emissions, it's the congestion, a whole range of costs arise. And given that they were, a lot of them would be moving from public transport or cycling or whatever. Um, and this is driven uh, partly by the one, one for flexibility, but the relocation, uh, it, why don't they want to uh, uh, work from home in their apartment in Dublin? It's accommodation costs. So it's conflating two things. If there was no economic benefit to moving out of the city, then there would be an environmental gain. But there could be a very significant environmental loss. Um, um, and the, the research done, the national planning framework, is all about denser living. And this could give rise to much less dense living, but much longer commuting and much higher emissions in transport. So um, uh, just one large public sector employer talking to with um, thousands of employees, they're really concerned about the issue of reopening because they know a lot of their employees have moved out of Dublin to live in the Midlands or whatever. And they're going to, if they reopen suddenly um, and they haven't re rented somewhere in Dublin, they're going to be commuting um, very long distances. So I think that that's, that's a really, and the data which you have on desire to relocate is interesting. Um, on this, it and Tom, Tom, you you do you did bring out um, the possible rebound effects in a very uh, useful way. Um, <clears throat> the increased emissions at home. I know myself, <clears throat> for myself and my wife, were in our seventies, although we're pretty fully employed, but being locked down in a cocoon, our emissions of electricity and gas are up 15 to 20 percent as a result of the crisis um, so we'd be um, I, I, we would have been spending some time at home um, uh, during the day so you've got to factor that in now, I don't know whether Trinity has <coughs> um, and the EPA have been heating their buildings um, um, uh, while I haven't been there but um, the, 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 there are definitely costs to 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 uh, in terms of emissions to people working from home um, especially like uh, people with children if the children are gone out of the house if they were gone out of the house you wouldn't be heating the house if you are if you are sensible um, <clears throat> um, uh, 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 the uh, the career effect uh, 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 the, the, there's a clear what this has established and what your survey establishes there's a clear desire for more flexible working there's no doubt about this and it is shown that more flexible working can work and um, the long-term effects in terms of productivity from the employer's point of view is not there's much less evidence on that talking to people um, in large generally public sector organizations they felt that things worked better the first three months of lockdown but the wheels began to come off the bus um, um, at a later stage in particular it's interaction and um, if you need people that, and I just see on the Climate Change Advisory Council, we are all new membership from February, but we've never met. It makes it very difficult to interact when you haven't met and had coffee together. And um, I ran a network of European Economic Research Institutes for um, the best part of 10 years. Um, and we did most of our work by over the phone, but it was a German who said to me, we had a very difficult French guy, he said, look, in Germany, if you have a row at work, you go off and have a beer afterwards, but you can't have a virtual beer. Um, uh, so uh, uh, if, uh, if, if, what, what you're look, looking at is a really valuable uh, insights into employees um, and there are definite gains and there are going to be definite wins. Um, you've raised the issue of equality. And uh, if it is likely, although your data on men was really interesting, um, men with child care responsibilities, that they were at least as keen on working from home. Um, but if it is predominantly women who are out of the office, 
that is definitely going to like if if you if somebody performs a management role or a coordination role and you're not around out of sight out of mind however it could in the long run be it have positive effects in terms of female participation in particular at the higher echelons because all the research done for Ireland and I think for other countries but certainly for Ireland by the ESRI shows the time out of the labour market um, um, is very heavily penalised in terms of earnings so if it allows women to continue working when they would not have worked and then after childcare responsibilities ease off and they're back in their time out of the labour market would be very much reduced and it could end up in the very long run in a benefit in terms of equality with a significant cost in the short run. It's impossible to know, but I think in raising that issue, um, um, uh, 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 I think it's very, very interesting. So um, from an environmental point of view, I think this shows potential um, for significant gains, um, but there could be a, an actual loss depending on how this works out. And one of the things in terms of um, uh, Owen, um, you highlighted, and it was interesting, it's the diesel cars that drive the longest distance. And that makes sense because diesel cars are cheaper on a long distance. However, EVs will be cheaper on a long distance. And the most economic, the people who should be taking up EVs first are the long distance commuters. In which case, if in, by the end of the decade, the environmental gains from reducing commuting by the really long distance commuters could be dramatically reduced um, by the time so that the environmental gains are at a point in time. But in the long run with EVs, if you just reprogram everything with EVs, what would it look like? It would look rather different. But then others like what you've brought out, I think Tom brought out the other social and economic benefits um, uh, from this. And uh, if you reduce commuting and congestion, then that's great. If it doesn't reduce commuting and congestion, um, it, 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 you have a problem. The, uh, but then there are the air quality benefits, but then the air quality benefits um, uh, arise if you have an EV. So I think we're, this is a, a very important piece of information in building a picture of the future of Ireland. Um, and I think that the, you establish here um, that the people of Ireland as workers want more flexibility and how we manage that to make for a better society and a more productive society and an environmentally more sustainable society. There's a lot of work, further work to be done. So thank you very much. Thanks, John. I think there's um, some fantastic points you've pulled out there and, you know, we could, there's so many more um, issues we could discuss. Uh, it's, it's just trying to identify the, the most, um, the most obvious and the most maybe interesting. And I know that you have um, taken time to review and met with us already about this. So thank you for, for your insights there. Um, we have some questions coming in. So there's a question about the slides. Will they be available? And we'll make the slides and the recording available to, to participants after this session. Um, and there's a couple of other other questions here that I might um, I might just take the first one um, from Anne. Um, along with the desire to relocate, do you think the presence of good quality public transport, um, for example, train and remote working hubs for social interaction are influential factors in the choice of location? Um, so we didn't gather information on that directly, Anne, um, but I suppose anecdotally, it, it tends to be a mix from what we understand. And the Western Development Commission, and I know my colleague Deirdre Frost is on the call this morning and working with Tommaso Shiokon there. They have a lot of work done in this space. Um, and it's a, it's a number of factors. Uh, quality of life certainly is one. Um, and But, you know, the question around public transport and there's this huge policy implications from what we're speaking about here and the real need for joined up thinking across a lot of, of factors um, that is really starting to come out. Um, there's another question from, actually, Owen, I might hand over to you. There was a question that was asked there. You said you'd answer it live. Um, yeah, so the, the question had to do with should the um should we focus more on working from home um rather than migrating to electric cars but you know where should the relative focus should be i i think the the migration to electric cars is still vital because commuting is only one aspect of the driving we do we drive for many other uh purposes as well 
So the migration to electric cars is absolutely vital. And I think John picked it up there as well. The electric vehicle that we are driving now is becoming vastly more efficient, both in terms of its manufacture, but also in terms of the electrical grid. And so for those who have to commute longer distances, uh, if they can migrate into EVs will definitely make um, sense, both environmentally and uh, economically in terms of the, the at least the, the usage of the EV itself. So I think we, I think the focus on EVs has to be maintained. And I think the ambition of 1 million might, might be very ambitious. I know the car industry would say that it's better to have a, that ambition there, I think, and try and go for it than not have it there. Thanks, Owen. And there's a question here for, for Tom um, from Matthew. Uh, Tom, you're going to pick that up there. Looking Thanks, Sammy. Yeah, it's a good point. Matthew Rees is about asking about um, whether we looked at the, the level of employees, so whether they're a junior, medium or senior uh, kind of ranking person in their organization and that the, the shift to remote working might disadvantage newer employees uh, on the basis that they, they might not have the same access to kind of training or just informal contact with senior colleagues. We haven't looked at it explicitly. And I'm not sure we have the data that would allow us, but I think this is another dimension of the inequality or distributional effects that we need to be aware of that, yeah, a lot of training that happens on the job is clearly kind of informal, or at least a lot of the, the learning that happens on the job is often informal. Um, so that might be something that's missing from a, from a world in which we increasingly work remotely. A good point. Uh, there's a question there for Owen. Uh, Owen, you put a percentage of female and male respondents. I think it was 73 to 23 female male. Was the percentage share surprising and might it distort the results somewhat? Um, the, yes, I suppose it was surprising. Um, and so there's two aspects. I think, yes, it could, of course, definitely uh, distort results. For example, the construction sector would be uh, overwhelmingly male and that's a sector that where for many people in that sector work from home when is not going to be an option so that obviously would have an impact um, but on the other side I, I just to counteract that slightly and there are sorry, other industrial sectors where that would also be the case but to counteract that slightly I think what was positive was that in the male responses the I suppose preference to work from home was as Tom said at least equally as strong as it was for uh, female workers so I guess that to some extent might counteract the imbalance in our survey, but certainly there are some sectors which will be more male uh, dominated where I think uh, the results are, you know, we would need more data in order to see how these results would apply in those sectors. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Owen. Um, so there's a couple of comments just saying thanks for all the data and a lot of interest in the data. Um, and we have quite a large number who have registered. So I imagine a lot will come on after to look at the recording and also to access the slides. Um, maybe I'll hand over, we are just coming up to 11. Um, maybe I'll hand back to John for a moment um, as, our, as our discussant and from your insights, John, with the, your work on the um, advisory council, et cetera. Uh, what do you think are the kind of top one or two things that if you were you know advising government from the data that you see today that you think is something they re we really should be prioritizing and moving on and even in the context of all that's going on with cop 26 at the moment well i i think what you establish is there are potential large gains from reducing commuting but how you realize those gains without increasing commuting by people moving and somebody i think one of the comments raise quality of life issues. Yeah, there are people, people uh, who would prefer to live in rural areas. And what you see, you saw the pattern up to 2007 development. Everybody in Ireland, not everybody, but an awful lot of want people to live in rural areas, but they wanted to work in urban areas, not sustainable. So um, I think it's a challenge of how you match people's preferences, which is what it's all about, um, with um, a, a, an environmentally sustainable world. Um, and there are no easy answers, but this provides important information. Um, absolutely, nothing is straightforward, John, and I completely agree with you there. So I just comes to me to, to sincerely thank everyone. I want to thank uh, in particular John Fitzgerald for joining us this morning. I was absolutely thrilled when John um, agreed to, to participate as our discussant. Um, any of us who've been around a while will, will know John from his life when he was working with the SRI and so on, and as a huge 
huge figure um, in our in our country nationally in terms of economic policy and and research and you're still you're still going strong John so it's great to see that even though you're uh, retired apparently uh, so thank you again for your time this morning I want to thank thank uh, Tom and Owen so I've really enjoyed uh, working with Tom and Owen here on this project because it has taken me out of my my little uh, silo space of HR and people management um, and and taking me into the world of, of economics and um, into engineering um, and, and looking at emissions etc so it's been great working with Tom and Owen on this and also Joseph who's a stu student here with us and has worked uh, hard on the data analysis and helped us this morning with this event and also Anna Farrell who worked with Tom a, a master's student also so it's been great to bring in our students and of course we know that our students are very interested in these issues in terms of the sustainability and the climate impact um, and finally but certainly not not least is Courtney and Angela from the Whitaker Institute uh, Whitaker Institute has been a fantastic platform for us in terms of disseminating all of our data here and um, the survey that we did in conjunction with the Western Development Commission has um, really got a lot of interest. So we're delighted to continue analyzing that data and helping policymakers and so on in, in the space. So a sincere thank you to everybody. And um, you'll hear from us again. We hope to do some further data analysis and there's lots of questions, as John said, that remain. So we look forward to, to working further on it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Everyone.